A Chinese spy used every imaginable means to approach U.S. politicians. This happened in an area with ideal conditions for foreign intelligence. Chinese residents are fleeing a mega city en masse. This after the city saw an outbreak of CCP virus cases. They fear the city will lock down like Wuhan. Cutting off gas and electricity in the bitter winter, local authorities in Beijing are forcing residents to leave their homes. The neighborhood will then be demolished by authorities, going against contracts they originally made. A leaked document becomes further evidence the Chinese Communist regime is detaining Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region arbitrarily. And a Swiss bank has ties to China's intelligence and military agencies, and it sent big money to the company behind U.S. voting system Dominion before the presidential election. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Now we turn to the case of a suspected Chinese spy. An exclusive investigation by Axios revealed a long-term potential Chinese spy operating in California. The person is known to have operated around upcoming Congress members. The discovery is seen as confirmation of Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, infiltration in the U.S. The Axios article spotlights Chinese national Christine Fang, also known as Fang Fang. She reportedly operated out of California's Bay Area and was photographed with a number of congressional or local-level politicians. The article cited U.S. intelligence officials and one former elected official. It explained Fang got close to political power through campaign fundraising, extensive networking, personal charisma, and romantic or sexual relationships with at least two Midwestern mayors. The article adds that gathering private yet unclassified information about government officials is crucial for foreign intelligence. That's because it helps foreign nationals to understand their targets. This kind of information can include their habits, preferences, schedules, social networks, and even rumors about them. Chinese spies have been known to approach local-level politicians. That's because Beijing knows they may rise to higher-level positions in the future. It's also common practice for female agents to engage in sexual relationships with targets to obtain blackmail material. The article zeroes in on Congressman Eric Swalwell. Fang reportedly took part in fundraising activities for Swalwell's 2014 re-election campaign. Federal Election Commission records don't indicate Fang herself made donations, which are prohibited from foreign nationals. Fang instead helped place at least one intern in Swalwell's office and interacted with Swalwell at multiple events over the course of several years. According to a statement from Swalwell's office provided to Axios, Swalwell met Fang more than eight years ago, but hasn't seen her in nearly six years. It added that the congressman provided information to the FBI about Fang. The bureau eventually took notice of her, who disappeared from the U.S. around 2015. Axios reported that the Bay Area offers ideal conditions for foreign intelligence gathering. Some of America's most powerful politicians got their start in Bay Area politics. While Silicon Valley is the world's most important center for the technology industry, making it a hotbed for Chinese economic espionage. California's economy is also the largest of all the U.S., giving California state lawmakers significant influence over national trends. Residents in one Chinese province's capital city are fleeing. This after the province entered wartime status, a similar policy to what's called a state of emergency in the U.S. NTD's Don Ma has more. Local authorities in China's southwestern Sichuan province announced that the province is entering wartime status on Tuesday. Crowds of people have been spotted in cars driving out of the province's capital. This after an outbreak of virus cases. The capital, Chengdu, is home to 16 million residents. By China's numbers, seven people have tested positive in the city in the last two days. But the Chinese regime has a history of underreporting cases, so it's suspected that the real number is much higher. Hundreds of testing sites are set up in the capital, and mandatory testing is required for residents. Lockdowns are also being enforced. One university is now under complete lockdown. Since Tuesday, no one has been allowed to leave the campus, and students must quarantine. Authorities forced all local restaurants and grocery stores to close, while a nearby hospital also closed its doors. Chengdu's airport already canceled more than 100 flights. 
The public is afraid of the virus. Many hospitals are being isolated. Schools are closed. You must wear a mask when you go out, and you must show your QR health code. Prices are rising, and life is harder now. Everyday life is becoming stressful. The measures come after one woman confirmed to be infected as of Tuesday, traveled to multiple locations, and came in contact with dozens in the city. Authorities are closing down the areas she's visited and quarantining those who were near her. Another resident told us that he believes that despite the rise in virus cases, authorities don't really care. He says they're just going through the motions with testing measures and lockdowns. You must wear masks in all public places. The government notices, street notices, all of them are formalities. Going through the motions just to put on an appearance. The temperature checking are all just gestures. In reality, they are not doing enough. Some measures are fake. People in Chengdu express concerns. The city might have to endure lockdowns similar to Wuhan, the virus epicenter. Locals are leaving en masse through train stations and in cars, while others are buying out pharmacy shelves. During Wuhan's lockdowns earlier this year, hospitals quickly filled, and many infected patients were forced to stay at home, often infecting the rest of their families. That's as others died of pre-existing conditions because hospitals only accepted virus patients. Forced demolition work continues inside one Beijing neighborhood. Official deeds to homes and other properties seem to hold no weight. In some cases, gas and electricity were cut off to homes to encourage residents to vacate. NTD's Chang Chun has the story. In a neighborhood called Zhihua Agricultural Science Demonstration Park in Beijing, authorities are escalating measures to drive residents out of their own homes. Wednesday is the first day that local government cut off the gas, water and electricity in the neighborhood. Mr. Zhang, one of the 300 homeowners, told us they are not allowed to burn coal. At present, residents can only rely on burning wood for heating. In the bitter winter, this is making him very worried. We called the Energy Administration and the State Power Corporation. The answer was that they received an order from the Xiaotang Shan Town Hall to cut the energy supply. Many people had coal at home, but they don't allow us to burn coal anymore. We can only cut branches to burn and keep warm. I'm worried that some people's houses catch fire accidentally. And there is also the risk of being poisoned by carbon monoxide. And some of the trees are so big that the elderly people in the family can't saw through them. I guess it's difficult to get a chainsaw and a machete into the neighborhood. Twenty years ago, the Xiaotang Shan Town Hall, where this neighborhood is located, invited people to invest in the neighborhood project. People bought the usage rights of land for 50 years and built their houses, with all of the necessary contracts with different levels of the regime's authorities. This was once considered to be a project that brought money in for the authorities. However, the town hall now claims these houses are illegal constructions and are set to be demolished. The land will be used for more profitable projects. In Jiangping district, we are not the only place where we are being treated unfairly. In at least three towns, they have torn up their contracts with people. Now, the Office for Promotion of Investment changed their signboard to Office for Forced Demolishing. The contract said people can use the land for 50 years. The official documents are in black ink on white paper with red official seals on it, but they deny everything. Mr. Zhang added the courts do not respond to any complaint or lawsuit filed by homeowners. Instead, they post the demolition notices on the walls of the houses in the neighborhood. At the end of last month, two houses had already been demolished without any agreement by the people living there. Earlier this month, the authorities demanded residents to demolish their houses themselves within one week. Otherwise, the authorities would send people to do it. Wednesday is the last day of the deadline. Reporting by Chang Chun, NTD News. Simply by being youthful and Muslim could get a person detained in China's Xinjiang region. This was revealed in a leaked document obtained by U.S.-based group Human Rights Watch. The document is a list of more than 2,000 ethnic Uyghur detainees between 2016 to 2018. It also details reasons for detention, including studying the Koran, wearing religious clothing, or traveling internationally, and also simply being young. Other reasons include things like repeatedly switching off a smartphone, having thoughts against the CCP, or being untrustworthy from the regime's perspective.
Human Rights Watch pointed out this list is further evidence that the CCP's reasons for detaining Uyghurs is arbitrary. This list is from Xinjiang's Aksu area. It shows detainees are flagged by a Chinese predictive policing program that collects data and identifies candidates for detention. The database stores information on a person's life, such as phone numbers, close contacts, apps they use online, and even the color of their car and whether they use the front or back door to their house. At least one million Uyghurs have been detained at some point in Xinjiang camps. In China, Huawei has tested AI software that can recognize Uyghur minorities and alert police. That's according to the Washington Post and a research group that discovered the test report. NTD's Patrick Hayden has the details. Telecom giant Huawei and facial recognition firm Megvi have developed AI software that can recognize Uyghurs. The technology can be used to send a Uyghur alarm directly to the police. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, has been heavily suppressing Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region. We need to be very conscious of the fact that Huawei is actually the leading surveillance company in the world. And often the case we understand it, it's just Hikvision or it's just Dawa. It actually the most dangerous company for both AI and facial recognition software is Huawei. Network specialist Steve Colan says phones and TV devices connect to 5G networks in the same way. He says both tech companies posted the Uyghur facial recognition report to their websites, demonstrating how arrogant and willing they are to serve the CCP. It is a statement by loyalists of the CCP that we have done this on behalf of the CCP and we're proud to be able to oppress those uh, minorities that the CCP wishes to oppress. He says it's also a way to promote what they can do for other countries. This is most notable in Africa. One example is in Uganda, where Huawei donated a lot of equipment, which was then used to monitor political adversaries. He says they are trying to improve facial recognition software for darker skin types seen in Africa. Because the technology is not quite there yet for facial recognition uh, of, the, of that ethnic group. And uh, that has been a serious focus for companies like Huawei. Uh, and we've seen it going on in Uganda and other countries. As disturbing as China's domestic human rights record is, it doesn't stop there. Huawei has been pushing their technology across the whole world. Many Western countries now consider it a security threat and have rejected it. Less developed countries have been tempted by financial gain through China's Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiatives. But it seems now more than ever those gains come at a significant social cost. Reporting from London, Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Hong Kong pro-democracy activist Agnes Chow was denied bail on Wednesday. Chow received a 10-month jail sentence on charges related to unauthorized assembly during anti-government protests last year. Chow went to jail on December 2nd for her role in a rally near police headquarters in 2019. Madam Justice Judiana Barnes of High Court in Hong Kong rejected her bail application. And yet the 24-year-old activist stays positive. Chow tweeted on Monday that many people wished her happy birthday and good health. She said she appreciates their kindness. Under the national security law, Beijing punishes what it broadly defines as sedition, secession, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces with up to life in jail. The appeal against Chao's sentence is pending. A Swiss bank linked to Chinese military intelligence operatives sent $400 million to Dominion Voting Systems' parent company before the election. NTD's Penny Zhou brings us that story. A Swiss bank that sent big money to Dominion voting systems before the election has ties to China's intelligence and military agencies. That's according to publicly available financial records. Georgia attorney Linwood sounded the alarm bells over UBS securities last week. The New York-based subsidiary of Swiss bank UBS sent $400 million to Dominion's parent company in October. The subsidiary is closely linked to UBS's Beijing-based joint venture. There, current and former board members are tied to Chinese communist military and intelligence agencies. In New York, three out of four UBS board members are Chinese. Some board members serve the company in New York and Beijing at the same time. Mu Lina was also a board member with China Trans Info, a major surveillance camera producer in China. 
It provides big data and artificial intelligence to Chinese authorities. Its chairman is a Communist Party member. Xu Zhe was a board member of the Beijing-based UBS. He was also the president of an IT firm controlled by the Chinese regime. The firm has assisted the regime's smart city initiative. Western experts see the initiative as a massive surveillance system. According to the IT firm's website, their partners include the People's Liberation Army's 61019 unit, the People's Liberation Army's 61195 unit, Science and Technology Achievement Exchange Center. And the CCP-controlled China Academy of Science. Yet another long-term board member and former CEO of UBS Securities in Beijing is Chen Yisun. He is the nephew of a Chinese military general and a key figure in Beijing's nuclear weapons development efforts. That's according to the former UBS CEO's own account in a Chinese publication. Cheng also recounted how he followed in the footsteps of his uncle to quote serve his motherland. He also worked to facilitate the bank's joint venture in Beijing. The Chinese regime owns 49 percent of the UBS in Beijing. In an unusual move, Beijing's UBS changed 12 out of its 14 board members right after the U.S. 2020 election. NTD's analysts believe the Beijing-based subsidiary may be trying to cover up its ties to the regime. The company has never done any large-scale turnover until this time. It's not clear why UBS Securities sent $400 million to Dominion Voting Systems' parent company in October. Penny Zhou, NTD News. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo spoke at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He says the Chinese Communist Party is poisoning our institutions. He and the director of national intelligence described the CCP strategy as rob, replicate, replace, and repress. NTD's Christina Kim has the story. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo asked schools to step up the fight against the Chinese Communist Party. He said administrators need to shut down groups backed by CCP money. Researchers, he said, should be vigilant against fraud and theft from the CCP. He asked students to truly stand for free speech. He said so many of our colleges are bought by Beijing. What more bad decisions will schools make because they are hooked on Chinese Communist Party cash? What professors will they be able to co-opt or to silence? What theft and espionage will they simply overlook? What business deals will get done? Pompeo said China sends 400,000 students a year to study in the U.S. and American schools received at least 1.3 billion dollars from China since 2013. Many universities failed to disclose gifts and funding from the Chinese regime. He gave several examples of students in American universities being harassed and repressed by the Chinese Communist Party. One student at the University of Georgia said, "Quote: They have harassed me." Repeatedly, and asked me to give them information about the activities of overseas democracy activists and dissidents, and they are particularly interested in the activities of Uyghurs and Tibetans. End of quote. Now, at Princeton, just this year, students in a Chinese politics class were forced to use code names on their work, lest the CCP discover their identities and prosecute them for free expression of views on Hong Kong and the CCP. Under its draconian new national security law, that's right here. This happened right here in the United States of America. American students. He also spoke of Vera Zhou, a U.S. permanent resident who attended the University of Washington. In October 2017, she went to China to visit her father, where she was placed in a re-education camp for five months and placed under house arrest for 18 months. All of this for using a virtual private network connection to her school's website. The U.S. State Department team petitioned her school to advocate for her return. But the University of Washington, a woman named Sarah Castro, the head of the Federal Relations Office, said she said that the university wouldn't help because of a multi-million-dollar deal with China. Zhou was released, but with no help from her school. Pompeo said the U.S. cannot allow this tyrannical regime to steal our stuff, brainwash our people, or buy off our institutions to help them cover up these activities. Christina Kim, NTD News. Goldman Sachs is acquiring 100% ownership of its securities joint venture in China. It would be the first Wall Street bank to do so. Goldman Sachs is the first global bank to take full ownership of its securities business in China. It will acquire the remaining 49% stake in Goldman Sachs Gaohua Securities Co. at some point next year. 
A Goldman Sachs spokesperson in Hong Kong confirmed that the transaction had been initiated with regulators. Most international banks in China own 51 percent of their security businesses, which typically house investment banking operations with a Chinese partner. An industry expert told NTD that the CCP is about appearance. It needs to show it is acting in accordance with the international norm. It needs to attract international investors and customers to keep its economy growing. It also needs to act the part in order to access the foreign markets, especially the American market. In November, J.P. Morgan took 71% of its China joint venture when it bought an extra 20% stake. Analysts believe it could be next in line to move to full ownership. J.P. Morgan declined to comment. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.